one of the famous stories that a lot of people, most people know, that Peter denied Jesus three times. And he was the one who told Jesus and even rebuked the Lord. Can you imagine rebuking the Almighty God, Jesus the Lord? He said, you will never go to the cross. You will never die. In fact, I will never disown you. I will never defect you. I will die before denying you. Some of you might think that this is a terrible failure on the part of Peter, and it is. I do not believe in the recorded Bible scripture anything lower than this incident that Peter experienced. Think about it. For three years he was with him. He had experienced miracles after miracles after miracles. He had just seen literally a thousand men go down to the dirt because Jesus had said, I am. He had just cut off one of the soldiers' ears And Jesus put that ear right back on. He had experienced all kinds of things. He was with the Lord God Almighty. He was invincible. And yet he fell to the point so low that it is very shameful to even mention. And yet the glorious part of this message is not highlighting the failure of Peter, but the amazing forgiveness of the Lord, how he has restored him back, that eventually after his restoration, he became the pillar in the early Christian church. He was the spokesperson for the gospel. In fact, for the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, he is the main character preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to, Listen to the amazing forgiveness, for our God is the God of second chances. He is always giving people a chance to be restored. And if you have ever fallen, if you have ever been distressed because of your sin, your inability to keep the law, to obey the Lord, and you do not find yourself any usefulness, thinking that you are not good enough to be used In the kingdom of God, this message is for you, that our Lord Jesus, even at the point of denying him, remember, Jesus was hated by the world. One of his own betrayed him and sold him. Now the centerpiece of his disciples, Peter disowns him, denies him not once, not twice, but three times. If you are sitting here this morning feeling feeble, weak, lost, if you're sitting here this morning thinking, I am not useful at all, how can I ever be used of God? Once upon a time, I was so zealous, I was so passionate, I was into the word of God, I was fired up for God, but something happened. And now I find myself totally inept, totally inadequate, I am not worthy to even call a child of God, some of you might be saying. I am here only because of the mercy of God. I'm here only because I trust in the forgiveness of God. You are where you ought to be, exactly God wants you to be. The place where God wants every one of us to be is the attitude that I cannot do anything on our own, that I am totally, totally incapable, powerless, without God. Apart from Christ, I can do nothing. If you have that attitude, that is the person that God is seeking. That is the person whom the Lord desires. It is not the one who is pompous, arrogant, and have the attitude, I can do this. I have the ability to accomplish this. After all, I've been to missions, I've been doing Bible studies, I've been doing all these so-called spiritual things. I am invincible. In your own way, you are arrogant, and the gospel will not penetrate your heart. If you have a stiff neck this morning, start loosening that neck of yours and start opening your heart to the word of God. Let us look at our main text, Matthew 26. 
Matthew 26, beginning with verse 69. Let us read through verse 75. Matthew 26, let us hear the words of God. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Amen. What is the simple, that is, what is the single greatest gift that God has ever given? What is the one single greatest gift that God has ever given? It is the gift of forgiveness, for without which there can be no salvation, there can be no fellowship with God, there can be no usefulness in the kingdom of God, Every one of us has received the forgiveness of God. And for this, we ought to be eternally grateful because with forgiveness of sin, we now have access to the throne of God. We are heaven-bound. We will live forever in all eternity. It is the gift of forgiveness. Micah even says, Who is a pardoning God like you? Amen. Who is is a pardoning God like you, like God. Nobody. No one pardons like our God. There is none like our God. He is great because not only he is powerful, not only is all-knowing and all-present, not only because he's so holy and righteous, he is like none other because he is a forgiving God. That means that we have given mercy. That means that we have been now offered a second leash on life. We now have another opportunity to be right with God. What gift this is. What honor and privilege. If you have never experienced that forgiveness, I pray that this morning you will experience it. If you are married this morning, both those who are here and those viewing us online, if you ever fought with your spouse, and you've done something wrong, and your spouse does not forgive you, oh, what a sweet moment it is when that eventual time comes when that wife or the husband says, I forgive you. What a sweet, sweet experience that is. And if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, or if you are a child to your parents, you've done something wrong, and eventually when you receive that forgiveness, and then some, what sweet Sweet experience, a moment of sweetness that is. And to say that our Lord God of the universe would forgive a sinner like me and us, what powerful incentive that is for us to live in this wicked world. No matter what the world throws at us, knowing that our God has forgiven us, and has removed our sins, that he does not remember our sins, that he desires that we be righteous so that we will eventually be with him in heaven for all eternity. What great joy this is. That is why I say to you, maintain that joy of salvation. Maintain that zeal, zest, passion, fervor for the Lord, no matter what the world throws at you, no matter what they do to you, maintain that enthusiasm for God. Run to God. For those of you who have barely made it into the church, which I am grateful, try to walk a little bit. If you've been crawling into the church to the arms of God, if you've been walking, why don't you jog a little bit? If you've been jogging, why don't you run? If you've been running, why don't you sprint 
to the house of God, not just to a building, but to the arms of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for there lies salvation. There lies joy, happiness, satisfaction, fulfillment. There, within the confines of the protection of Christ Jesus our Lord, you will find eternal security. You will not find it anywhere else. Why spend your time wasting your time elsewhere? Spend time in the house of God. What glorious, glorious thing it is to be spending time with our Lord. And that's exactly what we will be doing in heaven. What do you think we'll be doing in heaven? We'll be spending time with our Lord, just being with him because not just the gifts are valuable, he himself is our gift. Amen? Our God is is our gift. You and I have received this gift, not just the gift of eternal life, we have been given the gift of God himself. The joy of the Lord, therefore, is a result of receiving this God as our gift. John records, when Jesus was taken away to the trial, Peter was found himself between love and fear. He couldn't stay away from him. He loved him. His love for Jesus was genuine, but he also had fear. He did not want to be captured and die. But John records that John also was there, that Matthew does not record. John, the writer of John, says he himself was there because he was known to the high priest. He was able to go inside. And then he opened the gate for Peter to come in, and then John disappears from the scene. I think that John was there for the purpose of carrying out the plan of God and no more. John was there for the purpose of opening the door for Peter to go to experience the three denials. That teaches us that no matter how little, no matter how small we are being used of God. It is all within the eternal sovereign plan of God. So that when church asks you to serve him, when the church asks you to volunteer for something, realize that no matter how trivial it may seem to you, no matter how insignificant it may seem to you, do not say to yourself, why am I doing this? I am above this. I am higher than this why am i put in this situation and this position realize that god wants to use you like that donkey that jesus used to ride on to enter the city of jerusalem he wants to use every aspect of your life no matter what it is so when you are called upon serving him when you are called upon worshiping honoring him do not say no Say yes to him because you are being used of God. And a lot of times God would use his servant. God would use your small group leader. God will use your friends. God will use your circumstances to speak God's desire. And when you have a tugging of your conscience or of your heart, realize that it is the Holy Spirit that is saying, hey, do this, do that, go there, go there, go here. Do not neglect the Holy Spirit. Peter just couldn't stay away. His love for Jesus was real. He was outside sitting, keeping warm by the fire. This is a little before 1 o'clock in the morning. And the whole trial will only last for two hours. It is a two-minute offense, if you will to use football terminology. Just a rapid, rapid succession of trial and that the execution has to be done immediately. Let's talk about the first denial in verse 69. Would you look at there? Verse 69, we hear of a young woman. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, this was not only a woman, a young woman, a young girl at that, and a slave or a servant. In those days, women were looked down upon. They were equal with animals. 
They were not considered a human being almost. And for Peter, this pillar of Christianity, the one who was at the center core of Jesus' ministry, and to have this young slave girl, a door person, somebody who opens and closes the door for guests to go in and come out, he was so afraid of this little servant girl that he denies. And this is what, again, it says. Sitting outside, a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. And we see him answering in verse 70. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. There were a lot of people. A lot of people, not everybody can fit into the courtyard of where the trial was, so people were just hanging around, moving about everywhere, and so this servant girl says, so that she can have her voice heard by the crowd, you were with Jesus, weren't you? You were with Jesus, and he says, Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. Mark adds, Jesus the Nazarene of Galilee. Nazarene. In those days when you make a claim like that, Jesus of Nazareth, or in our case, somebody, somebody of Yorba Linda or Fullerton or something like that, it is an insult, ridicule, scorn, scoff, sneer, taunt. So they would say, you were with Jesus of Nazareth. She was putting him down. Remember, Nazarene was one of those places, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth. That was a place that was not a very popular place. People looked down upon that city. In fact, we are told in the Bible what good thing can come out of Nazarene or Nazareth. And Jesus Christ, of course, came out of there. He was the carpenter, and, of course, he saved our souls. Verse 70, he denied it before them, all saying, I do not know what you mean. John tells us, he says, I am not, I don't know him, you don't know what you're saying. How can one go down this low? How can one be at the pinnacle of his strength, and the next moment, how can he, the same person, go down so low? What is Peter doing denying Jesus? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make this point that most of you, most of us, we are ready for the big moment. Peter was ready for the big moment. If Jesus were to call him into trial to testify, he would have done so in a very big way. You and I are ready for the big thing because we can anticipate what to come. We can be ready for the sermon. We can be ready for a Bible study. We can be ready for a small group. We can be ready and we can be ready for any kind of temptations or anything that can go wrong and we can prepare it ahead of time in anticipation. But what Peter and what you and I are not ready for are the little things that can trip us. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was ready for big things. He was ready for the big moment. He was not ready for the small, unexpected thing. Kind of reminiscent of Elijah who killed 450 false priests. And then when a woman threatened his life, he ran to the desert. In fact, he wanted to die. How can the prophet Elijah, who had just slaughtered 450 false priests, and then at the sound of a woman saying, I'm going to kill you, he just flees. Peter has seen miracles. He has heard words never been uttered out of any person's mouth. He walked on water, Peter did. Paul says this, Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. Anyone who thinks you are standing, be careful because you are going to fall. Your character isn't manifested by what you prepare to do, but by what you are not prepared to do. 
It is known by our involuntary reaction. Not something that we prepare to do, but something that we do in response that we're not ready to do. Your character is known not when you are sitting in a church. You know, to become a new member of Cross Point, you have to confess that Jesus is Lord. To be baptized, you have to be confessing that Jesus is Lord. In fact, confessing Jesus as Lord is so easy to do in church. No one is going to say, if I were to ask you, do you believe, have you accepted Christ? And if you say yes, I'm not going to say, oh boy, you accepted Christ? He's your Lord? What is not easy is outside the church, when was the last time you were faced with that? You said to yourself, I will never going to deny, but then you found yourself with the crowd doing the same thing. Peter couldn't get prepared for this one. It was a result of his strong ego, unwillingness to listen, a failure to pray, acting on self, and acting on impulse. Luke tells us that Peter did not leave after his first denial because it will look like he is a liar. So he stayed where the light was not as bright, the moonlight was not that visible. He stayed close to the exit so that when things got really, really tough, that he can exit. But he stayed there, still wanting to find out what would happen to his Lord Jesus. That's when the rooster crowed the first time, but he didn't hear it. So we go to the second denial in verse 71. 71 says, and when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, the term Nazareth was used. Luke adds, a man also confronted him. There was another man there that confronted him along with this little girl. And in verse 72, and again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. He's afraid, he's angry, he's confused, he's frustrated, and now he's trapped. Having lied once, he has to lie again to cover for his lies. This time, he doesn't just lie, double lies. Lied, lied, and lied that he didn't lie. Lies will grow. If you ever lied, you need to lie again to cover that up, and it just keeps on growing. An oath is to swear to the truth. The ultimate oath to swear by the living God, and that's what he did. I swear by the living God that I do not know the man. What are you talking about? I do not know him. I have nothing to do with him. He not only said, I am not with him. He says, I do not know him. He denied even knowing Jesus. In spite of great spiritual privileges and experiences, some of you have great, great experiences. Some of you have mountaintop experiences. Maybe you have uttered some ecstatic words that's coming out of you. You have known some spiritual, supernatural knowledge that's given you. Maybe a vision, maybe a sign, maybe a wonder, maybe something that God has given you, an experience, no matter what your spiritual privileges or experiences are, you are not invincible, we are not invincible. It doesn't matter whatever experience. Think about it. Peter walked on water. He experienced resurrection of people that Jesus performed. He saw healings of all sorts, casting out demons, and yet he falls by a servant girl. Let's look at the third denial in 73. Verse 73, we read, After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Accent betrays you. While I was in Busan, for some reason, Busanians did not like to show their accent when people from Seoul would come down. They wanted to sound sophisticated. So in their accent, in their dialect, they would try to sound like a... People from Seoul, and it was, you can always tell, because there's that little up and down-ish thing going on. You can always tell, but they try. For some reason, some people are at least 
ashamed that they are not, for some reason, educated. And that's highly not the case. It's just the way you were born in that region of the country. But they wanted to sound like the newscasters and people who are so-called in Seoul universities and so on up there in the capital. They try to cover themselves, hide themselves, but you can always tell. Your accent betrays you. Your accent tells me that you are a Galilean, that you are one of Jesus. Luke tells us that it's about an hour later, after the first and the second denial. In verse 74, then he began to invoke a curse on himself and swear, I do not know the man. Cursing is to pronounce death upon yourself at the hand of God. Kill me, damn me, kill me. And he was pronouncing a curse. Not only did he lie, not only did he swear, he started cursing to himself and everyone else. If you say that I am with Jesus, damn you, go to hell, he's saying. I am cursing you. That's a serious, serious sin. He has lost all fear of God at this point. The third denial and we are told that he began to curse, meaning he kept on cursing. 74, and immediately the rooster crowed. The rooster crowed. That's the second time the rooster crows at about 3 a.m. That's when the rooster crows. We are told in Luke 22, 61. Luke 22, 61. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And in verse 60, just a passage before that, while Peter was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Immediately, immediately upon the rooster crowing, Jesus turned and looked at Peter, covered with spit, battered and bleeding and puffy face, looking at Peter. This deliver blows that are infinitely worse than any fist could ever deliver. That look of Jesus. And then Peter realized that's exactly what he said I would do. Immediately frozen like a still picture, crystallized in one moment of time, had realized what he had done. How could anyone sink to to that level. How could anybody sink to that level? You might be weak today. You might be a weak Christian today, but you will never deny Christ, would you? Once, twice, three times, and curse? You would never do that, would you? How could anyone sink to that level? Well, let me give you the reasons. This just did not happen. Number one, it happened as a result of self Confidence, number one, self-confidence. Thinking his warm feeling would be enough to handle anything. Some of you have this warm feeling that you are a child of God, that you are a strong person, that your stubbornness, that your will will take you all the way to eternity. Your self-confidence will sink you to that level. Second is insubordination. Jesus told him twice, but he denied it both times didn't subordinate to the word of God. That is why it is so important to obey his word. When Jesus says something, we ought to obey it instead of denying the power of God. Thirdly, prayerlessness. He slept instead of praying. He slept instead of watching for temptation. He neglected his spiritual duty. The word of God, as important as it is, you need to pray. You need to pray and watch. Pray, prayer and word, word and prayer. In fact, the apostles, when the work got so, so heavy, when Christians began to multiply by the thousands, the apostles had so much on their plate that they actually made seven deacons to do these chores so that the apostles can spend time in two areas and two areas alone that's in word and in prayer. Their job was to simply pray and preach the word. That was the job of the apostles, and that ought to be the job of any preacher, any pastor, so that other people can take up all the other things. 
and it is not sometimes readily available. We need volunteers. When God calls you to do something for the kingdom of God, again, do not say that's beneath me, that's below me, but say yes to the calling of God. Fourth reason why anyone can sink to this level is independence. He acted on his own which led to disastrous results. Whenever you go ahead of God, whenever you go ahead of God's plan, whenever you go ahead of the Holy Spirit, you put the Holy Spirit behind you. Rather, you ought to be behind Him. You ought to be behind His plan, His purpose, His goal, His desire. You ought to be doing what He wants you to do. Peter was independently acting on his own. And finally, compromise will sink you to that level. He mingled with the crowd, the enemy of Christ. Instead of fleeing all the way, he stayed somewhere neutral. He compromised himself. He did not go close to Jesus where he was because he was afraid. He did not go all the way fleeing because he still wanted to be close enough, but he was far enough away from Jesus that this led to his sin, his denying, mingling with the crowd, the enemy of Christ. If you are flirting with the temptations of the world, if you are just simply playing with, flirting with, oh, I will get out, I can get out, kind of like that base runner on first base, oh, I'm just going to tease, I'm going to fake like I'm going to go to the second. Or Classic case is a third base runner coming home pretending like he is going. So when the pitcher pitches and the ball is being exchanged between the pitcher and catcher, he's like, you know, doing this kind of thing to throw off the pitcher. Only he gets thrown out at third base or at home. Do not flirt with the temptations of the world thinking, I am strong enough. Oh, it doesn't matter. I could be with a girl in a dark place. 30 minutes, one hour may be a little dangerous. 30 minutes I can handle. Again, Anything that you can plan ahead, you are ready. But anything that comes without expecting, you are doomed to fall. And it's true in every facet of life. Do not compromise. Peter should have either been right where Christ was or should have been gone from there. Verse 74, And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, How he has said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. We need to give credit to Peter where credit is due. He did not commit suicide like Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. Peter denied Jesus. But Peter, it says we're told that he went out and wept bitterly. It is an uncontrollable crying, sobbing. He was so heartbroken that he sobbed uncontrollably. He confessed. It wasn't until Peter saw the face of Jesus that he remembered the words of Jesus. I want you to know that sin does not cause us to repent. Sin does not cause us to confess. It is when you face the righteousness of Jesus, when you look on the face of Jesus, that enables us to confess. That is why at Cross Point we emphasize the gloriousness, the holiness of God, which will enable us to realize how sinful we are, how wretched we are, And that would, in turn, make us confess. It was the Savior, not the sin, that made him weep. Weeping bitterly means to weep audibly, to sob loudly, wrenched in the agony of repentance. Verse 75, we're told that Peter went out. None of the gospel writers tell us where he went or what he said because this is a private moment. No one needs to know. Your prayer between you and God. And the gospel writers, none of them tells us where he went or what he said. We do know that he wept bitterly. And John 21 tells us after his resurrection, Jesus goes back to Peter, reinstating him by asking him, Do you love me, Peter? Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? How many times did he ask him? 
three times to give him the assurance that even though he denied Jesus as Lord three times, Jesus the Lord forgave him and that that gave him assurance that allowed him to become, again, that pillar in the first century, in the early Christian church. That is a very hopeful thing for us because we are so glad to have a God of forgiveness. We are so glad to have a God who's in the business of giving us another chance to the fallen people, even picking up the ones who have denied Christ. If you have ever become a failure, if you call yourself, I'm the lowest of the lowest, I'm the scum of the scum, I am the least of all Christians, I will be at the bottom base bunker when I get to heaven. I'll be lucky just to make it to the entrance of heaven. I'll be glad just to make it over that hump. I'll be glad. Maybe some of you are sitting like doing like that. The Apostle Paul said similar things. I am the least of the apostles. I used to be the persecutor of the church, but by the grace of God, I am who I am. Again, that is the attitude, the exact attitude that God wants all of us to have. When we go to the book that Peter wrote at the end, 1st and 2nd Peter, talking about confidence, which he lacked at the moment of his denial, he says, you can be confident by being humble. And in subordination, he says, obey God. Did he talk about prayer? He says, watch and pray. Did he talk about compromise? He says, be faithful till the end, to death. He has learned his lesson, all of that right here. Peter, yes, sunk to the lowest of the low. But Jesus, the ultimate forgiveness giver, he had forgiven Peter and elevated him to where God would use him. May today be the first day of your revitalization. May today be the first day of your recovery. May today be the first day where you come back to the Lord. May today be the first day of serving the Lord. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and for evermore. Amen.